Mike, welcome onto the Searching for Mana show. Great, thank you for having me. Pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, Michael, known as Mike Wiseman, the Chief Executive Officer, CEO with SoundCloud, uh, 10 years just edged over a year now, I believe, uh, has a background from Pennsylvania University, has worked um, at some headline companies, uh, Viacom, Vimeo, uh, I think early on Universal Music. Um, so really excited to, in the middle part of the show, go through your bio and understand how you landed this seminal opportunity. Um, but to start with, Mike, if you could be so kind to um, explain to the audience as if they didn't know uh, who SoundCloud are and what you guys are up to right now, please. Yeah, and, and thanks for having me. Excited to have this conversation. Um, Digging into more on SoundCloud, my background, hopefully it'd be helpful to and interesting to your audience as well. Uh, so the, the way to think about SoundCloud is we're really what building what a next generation music and entertainment company looks like. And before I go into what specifically we're doing, our thesis is pretty simple. Right now in music, you have streaming platforms, Amazon, Spotify, Apple Music, that are great businesses, have lots of users, lots of scale, but don't have a direct relationship with the artist or with the intellectual property. On the flip side of the music business, you have record labels, publishers, um, independent labels, distributors, who have great businesses as well, but have no direct relationship with a fan or a consumer. And in today's media landscape, that sort of split and barrier between the two doesn't really make much sense. I mean, look at sort of streaming video where Netflix, uh, HBO Max, Peacock in the US all have direct relationships with both the content and the fan. Video games, same thing. You look at things like Fortnite and what Epic Gaming is doing, it's direct relationship between fan and artist. And so what we're ultimately trying to do to be, at SoundCloud is to bridge that gap, is to be really the first streaming platform that has direct relationships with both creators and artists as well as fans. And there's a multitude of things that we're doing along those lines to build that, that kind of music company of the future. Thanks, Mike. Really exciting and sounds logical. What would be um, compelling is to understand, if you could, one example of that happening right now, please. Yeah, so the, the most tangible example of that happening right now is what we're doing for what we call Fan Powered SoundCloud. So over the past two years, we've been uh, rebuilding the way that music is music and royalties is paid out on SoundCloud. So on most streaming platforms, there's revenue on one side and then there's the artist payouts on the other side. And those two are actually not connected directly. What we're simply doing is the music that you listen to on SoundCloud, that money, the money that you generate from your subscriptions and advertising on SoundCloud goes to the artists that you listen to directly. And there's no sort of intermediary calculations. That's the simplest manifestation of what we're trying to do. And there's a lot of features and products and things alongside of that as well. Just to try and understand that. Yeah. Um, a layer further. I'm the, the lead singer in a band, which would never happen because um, I've got terrible <laughs> vocals. But, it, you know, in this, in this dream example, we're going to do that. You know, it's, it's Lloyd and the Monites. And um, we decide that we're going to drop our, our uh, 10 track album. Um, yes. And we are going to look through what the myriad of options are for us to do that. Yeah. And we would, in this scenario, um, find it alluring to do it on SoundCloud because yeah. the individuals who decide to then purchase our album in this instance, we would get, and then here's the question, then really explain that to me, the, a proportion of the money that they buy that album with, um, and how have you taken out therefore the middle kind of calculation of what the weighting is there, all of that money, or is there like a royalty as it moves forward? So, so that like Lloyd and the Monorites can really understand the, the commercial opportunity here, please. Right. So Lloyd and the Monorites, who are now hitting the top of the charts for being the hottest <laughs> band in the world um, with an incredible lead singer. Uh, think of it this way. So in it's not purchasing your album. It's really SoundCloud. People are subscribing or listening for free with advertising. So when you put your album up directly as an independent artist, if I'm, the, if I'm a fan of your band and I listen to your tracks from that album, my proportion of my subscription goes directly to you and your band. 
Now, that's not the way it works on other streaming services. And that's the key. And people don't realize that. It's very intuitive. You think that I listen to your band, I'm, my money's going to your band. It doesn't on any other streaming service. What happens on most streaming services is my money goes into a pool of revenue. And then your band's share of all the listening is calculated and created a market share, a tiny fraction of a market share. And then you're paid out on those two pools being put together at the end of each month. Yep. So what I'm, what we're ultimately trying to do is what many companies are trying to do in, um, in entertainment, in the video game space, in the media space, which is really bridging the gap so that fans and artists can directly transact. And that's ultimately where we're trying to get to. And then from there, as we continue the discussion, there's lots more opportunities that emerge, emerge thereafter. Cheers, Mike. Yeah, really compelling. Um, so if we think of um, some of these entertainment options, what I've really noticed, as I think the whole world has, <clears throat> is over the last five years, how much they're becoming studios and how much they're content creating. So that yes. often the differentiation of if I were to sign up to Disney or uh, Netflix may well just be the headline show that they they typically recently have managed to produce and then you start seeing these studios at the Oscars and like the whole industry has flipped from his head really really exciting um, period of time what's your play in that coming from um, you know your entry into SoundCloud which would have been known as I think certainly for me anyway as a, a real loose outside perception a technology music platform um, and I tended to know it for like this is where like Berlin DJs would drop their album right. uh, which, which is amazing but that's what it was that's quite niche so like now over this year how did you see that opportunity of what you've now created which is clearly massive and actually if you could finish that with the range of how much creation you're doing right now and it's not just Lloyd and the Marner rights it's not just music is it entertainment across the board yeah, so when well, I get to how it becomes entertainment, but alongside that, that fan thesis, um, what SoundCloud is, and depending on what country you're in, is really known for, is the next generation of musical talent starts on SoundCloud. So everyone from Billie Eilish to Post Malone to Little Uzi to, in 2016, 17, there's a whole genre of music called SoundCloud rap. There was no Spotify pop. There was no Pandora hip hop. There was no Pandora rock. There was music genres kind of emerging, uh, typically starts underground independent music. And what, we, what we're doing is to help those artists as they start to build their career and they upload tracks to SoundCloud, is we provide them products, tools, and services. Some of it's software-based, some of it's you know, more services-oriented. And then now over the past year, we've been providing a lot of that, what we think of a breakout talent, capital, marketing support, distribution to really build out their careers much more broadly using SoundCloud as their home base. So it really becomes more of a full-fledged artist services business at the end of the day, where we're helping to find talent and then get that talent going. And in a lot of cases, actually providing creative support along the way too. So is someone like Post Malone, you know, he, choose, he chose the tool for many different reasons, but yeah. based on what you just said, some of it actually was the application and the ability for him to mm. produce and release it on there, that toolkit. And then where you are now, maybe with him as well, be interested if this was the case, is distribution's huge, right? And I, th I think I was researching that you guys have double the amount of subscribers to, to Spotify, so, so, somewhere around that, that realm, which is, am I wrong? So, no, we have, we have about five, depending on how you calculate, five to eight times the amount of tracks as, as Spotify. Yeah. Okay. Spotify still has the num biggest number of actually paid subscribers, but we have a much larger catalog because it's independent music and user generated a lot of times. Got it. And then at that point where you've got more people coming to it, like let's call it the underground, yeah. certainly that's previously, surely there's like a, a war for them when you see a Post Malone emerging. And he's usually toolkit underground, but he's now thinking, or quite frankly, maybe someone else is advising him. You might be one of the biggest like artists on the planet if you get this right. How does right. SoundCloud retain him versus, you know, him getting lured over to Apple or Spotify? Or does it not work like that? Are they actually across all of these platforms? How's it well, So when an artist starts today, they typically start by dropping the track on SoundCloud because you don't need a, a middleman, a label, or a distributor, or anyone else to help get your tracks onto other streaming services. So artist starts by dropping a track. From there, they get a little bit of traction. 
we then also offer the ability for that artist to use SoundCloud's tools and technology to put that track into Spotify, Apple, Amazon, Twitch. We can help get you into TikTok's music backend, et cetera. Then what happens is as that artist starts to get traction, uh, there are a lot of people, if, if they're really starting to bubble up and become viral or start to see real success or this real creative energy, you have a handful of constituents, record labels, distributors, agents start to basically gravitate towards that artist, trying to use whatever data tools and mining they can. Now, the, the difference is they're using SoundCloud from the outside in. We're using the inside out since we know all of the ins and outs of what's really happening with that artist's music on SoundCloud and through other services that we're distributing into. So we ultimately have incredible first party proprietary data to get out ahead so that Post Malone, you know, potentially has never left SoundCloud and gone to a record label, but stays within our ecosystem. Very cool. And you know that because um, I asked a question with about 20 questions in it. So apologies. Yeah. <laughs> Good questions, deep questions. Yeah. But, but one of them I'll come back to is how much curation is planned or going on at SoundCloud? Yeah, there's there's a few layers of curation with any with any streaming service. There's kind of two major buckets. There's um, algorithmic recommendation system curation, which is if you Lloyd listen to you know Post Malone and you listen to Billie Eilish, you may like this other artist. That's sort of the typical uh, recommendation system analysis that everyone has. Two is we have human based curators who are listening to music, putting it into playlists, very sort of standard. The third way we look at it, which is we have a lot of behind the scenes data and ML analysis to really understand what artists are listening to which other artists. And that's actually the most interesting because that's how music scenes are formed. So we've been tracking and we actually just released a documentary about the scene called Plug with two Gs, which is kind of a variant of trap, Southern hip hop, et cetera. And the reason we found that was we found a lot of the artists who were calling themselves as part of the plug scene were following other artists. And that's really how music is formed. And 20, 30 years ago, kind of pre-internet area, that music was formed very focused on geographies. So East Coast hip hop, West Coast hip hop, the electronic scene in Berlin. Now what we're seeing is the digital manifestation of that, which is you have these communities forming on SoundCloud that they may be a kid in Atlanta and someone in Sweden, but they're making the same type of music because they can do that, you know, with, through communities like that. Very cool. Um, okay, that's given us a good understanding of um, the application right yeah. now. I'd like to also introduce the audience to, to your journey as being the CEO over the last year um, yeah. and really understand, you know, because it's such a vast creative opportunity that you know you've got the privilege to 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 sit um on the on the top of like how are you going through your week and how is it split up and what are the like really big challenges and priorities for you right now and i'm, I'm saying that from a like internal perspective from an internal yeah right so what's on my calendar today some of it's exciting some of it's uh like operating any sort of mid-sized business and media technology you know, we, the way I think about it is I always have keep three priorities at the top of my list. And those are sort of the big, big projects I'm leading. Um, and if I had to sort of say those transparently, they're, you know, how do we finance the business, right? Because I think any private company in today's environment is thinking about ways to extend the company's, you know, cash runway, ways to finance the business, things that had been out there in the venture and private markets, and even in sort of the emerging kind of earlier stage IPO market has definitely changed dramatically in the last 90 days and if not 180 days. So that's topic one. Topic two is part of my role is always sort of organization and leadership development. Are we setting ourselves up right? Because we're trying to do some very interesting things in music and some of it's functional product and engineering organizations, marketing organizations, but how are we actually trying to bring some of the products and services to life? And then the third thing is <clears throat> I always kind of have a series of, you know, things that I need to go execute day to day. And the, the sort of third one, but maybe the fourth one is our two big thing is we're in the midst of licensing uh, with the music industry at large, this concept of fan power that I discussed at the beginning. So that is a sort of a industry negotiation licensing effort that taking a lot of time up. <clears throat> Amazing. And just to give us some type of context of scale, again, internally of the organization, um, and again, from research, 
but these might be old figures or I've got them wrong. You know, the valuation of the business now is somewhere around 800 million, um, you know, if that's correct. How much staff is there? Where are they distributed? We could have some type of those metrics, please. Um, I can't really speak to valuation. Um, I'd like to say it's north of that, though. <laughs> And uh, in terms of scale, are about 450 employees, uh, roughly evenly distributed between the US and the EU. Um, so we have a couple offices in New York, LA. We have some staff that we're building up in Atlanta, which is center of music and hip hop in the US. Uh, and then two offices in Europe, one is in London, one is in Berlin. Very cool. Sorry. So just to be clear, audience, the valuation is much higher. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Fantastic. Um, so, so look, that's a, that's a lot of people, and um, I like to know what culture you came into. Uh, is it exactly the same, or what have you had to go to work on to align this new brilliant vision and opportunity? And then, how have you gone to work on that to get everybody on board that mission culturally? Yeah, so I I'd say the biggest transition for the business is um, I joined SoundCloud about five years ago, became CEO as you said, a little over about a year and a half ago. Um, and the biggest transition I've said is, you know, generally SoundCloud was a much more of a tech business. When I came into the company five years ago, and even a couple of years ago, it was sort of operating as a tech company in music. And I'm a big believer in sort of not just saying you're tech in this industry, but you are really inherently part of the industry. And the cultural transformation we've been going through is, you know, how do you also have in music, you need to really feel for the artist, which is you need the creative energy, you need the marketing, you need the promotional aspects of how to actually build out an artist's career. And that's, while tech can enable a lot of that, you also need that creative sort of energy in the business. Um, and so I've been very much trying to model ourselves after some of the companies that I think have gotten kind of creative energy plus technology right, which is Netflix, Disney, um, even some of the video game studios, you know, some of the folks that are releasing a take two, like that creative capacity alongside strong technology is really how you break out in kind of media at large. So over the past year and a half, we've been adding a lot more folks and sort of music from music backgrounds, from record label backgrounds, from people who come from um, branded alongside, you know, really trying to level up our talent and our product and engineering at the same time. Mike, I'm sure... I'm sure you probably have. You've read um, Creativity Inc. Yes, that actually. I, now that you said that, Pixar is probably this shining example of that, right? Where you know Pixar started as computer graphics software underneath Lucas Films or underneath George Lucas's entity, and ultimately started realizing as they started using their own software, they could produce some of the greatest animation and creative content. Fast forward 15, you know, 20 years and after the company was founded and sort of when Steve Jobs came in, ultimately Pixar was the greatest storytelling company of all time. Um, and, you know, string of hits that probably has never been replicated from a single studio uh, and all original as well. So unlike, and even though I think Disney and Marvel has been incredible, what they've done with it, those are all existing IP. Um, Pixar was uniquely using original IP to do so. And interesting fun fact, you can still buy Pixar as software today. They still sell their software called RenderMan online. So it's still a technology company at the core selling software. Yeah, it's such a brilliant book to the point that you were talking about. Totally. And it's a really good um, idea <clears throat> when you're you know, lead, leading a, a project, an initiative, an organization, a culture yeah. to try and have some um, kind of North Star, some shining examples of organizations that you'd love to to emulate and um yeah it just made me think of a few things like um shoe dog the nike book is is a pretty good example of bringing a bunch exactly. of passionate athletes together who really cared about the product and then making a brilliant innovative business out of it i mean a lot of that was financially very stressful for that founder uh, as, totally. as, as it will be but pixar was a brilliant example of you know steve jobs would say those clashing of stones of bringing you know creatively passionate people on the forefront of technology. But like some of the things that I took from that book that were amazing is, you know, really the leader of Pixar very early on understanding that actually the number one thing that he needed to focus on was making the organization creative and managed incredibly well, which wouldn't be the natural way that you would have thought about that type of operation at the point. Brilliant book, highly recommend it. And so you, 
have got a really exciting scenario where you feel you've got that environment yeah. of Saud Cloud. Um, are there any challenges that come with that? Well, yes, there's always challenges. One is, you know, just day-to-day -day execution of uh, releasing products, shipping products, marketing. Um, we're, we're operating in the music ecosystem. So with music, you have a lot of uh, large entities like the record labels, music publishers. Outside the US, there's things called collection societies in Europe. So you're always navigating a pretty, actually an overly complex rights framework around music. Um, and then, you know, day to day is operating in sort of private company in today's technology market, as I said earlier, is yeah. becoming trickier and trickier. So, you know, on the show, we have a, an interest. We were talking just in brief before the show yeah. in blockchain, crypto, Web3. <clears throat> and we're seeing a lot of, you know, the creators, um, the, probably the biggest movement has been uh, NFTs. And there have been albums released um, by this um, smart contract technology. There's an awful lot of digital art that is um, yeah. being released where if you look at the amount that the individuals are able to earn who create it there, because the royalties are set by them and in their hands, um, and it's not in all instances, yeah. it's really great. Um, and the example there is versus Spotify, for instance, it's the yes. exact example you get totally. given. How are you looking at this? And, yeah. and, and also, because I'm asking 50 questions every time, my second point to that question is, is that a way around those regulations and those intermediaries that you're spending a lot of time at the moment with friction? So I'll start with just that concept at large. Music used to be like that. Right. When you're out, if you're trying to buy music in 1995, you weren't signing up to a subscription and getting access to three records. And maybe you were, there was something called uh, basically music clubs, but I was purchasing music from bands. I was purchasing t-shirts directly and I was owning that CD. And so that concept has been, has been in the history of music. It's only in the last decade or so that we moved away to an access product where you pay one price point to all the world's music generally. And that, that shift away from music ownership and fandom we've actually lost in the last decade. So with what we're doing with what we call fan powered SoundCloud and what, what NFTs ultimately do is create that relationship again, where I actually feel like I have an ownership stake as a fan to an artist's work. And that happens in art. It happens in books. It hasn't happened. It needs to actually come back in music. So that, that thesis that, that NFTs and kind of Web3 is trying to enable in music is really at the core of where music has always been and probably should be in the future. So just I, that starting with that, that high level conceptually makes complete and utter sense to me. And I think we need to move the industry in that direction generally. <clears throat> and would that counter the, you know, laws that have been created, the contracts, the regulations around these royalties and artist um, rights that seems to be nonsensical based on the point you just just made uh, i'd say i'd say it in a few ways one is um we have to shift with look the streaming streaming music has brought the industry back to growth so, you know music was in net decline up until 2015 16 as an industry you know the last five or six years has actually been one of the growing fastest growing parts of entertainment and has probably another decade or so of growth ahead of streaming as streaming continues to grow and I'll get to the point around sort of music licensing, but one of the challenges is today, and I, sort of the analogy I use is, if I'm a fan of music, I don't go buy Spotify subscription, an Amazon subscription, an Apple subscription, a SoundCloud subscription, well, maybe SoundCloud I would as well, Pandora subscription, Sirius Satellite subscription. I'm not buying seven or eight subscriptions, right? So my, as a consumer, I'm kind of maxed out at 10 pounds a month or $10 a month is the most I can spend. <clears throat> Now in video, I can go buy HBO Max and Netflix and Amazon Prime and Hulu Live TV and you go down the list and I may be spending $200 a month. So the consumer's spending is capped because music has essentially been capped at the one single price point subscription. Now the industry has moved a lot of the licensing towards that as the kind of primary business model, but that's not to say you can't move it towards something else as the primary business model. And as I said before, when um, the majority of the industry is based on either downloads through iTunes or CD purchases, those were models where people were purchasing directly you know, from an artist. Now, record labels were involved and they probably still will be in the future with NFTs in some capacity, but there is those historical precedents. So it's kind of shift, the industry has shifted in one way and you have to kind of shift everything back in a different direction. And I think that's the challenge today. Amazing. Mike, we'll pick up with some future projections, yes. how, how you see this um, 
industry moving yeah. forward in the final part of the show. Now we're going to um, go back through some of your bio. Okay. Um, to start off that section so that we can get an idea of, um, of you before we go through the bio, I've just got some spot questions. Feel yeah. free to answer them incredibly um, succinctly mm -hmm. or elaborate if it's a, an interesting point to you. Yeah. Okay. What keeps you up at night? Uh, what keeps me up at night? Quite a bit. <laughs> no, what keeps me up at night is um, is trying to find focus on all the things you're working on, and and that even though it goes for personal life, it's you know I I tend to this is I know I didn't answer this quickly. No, 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 please carry I on. Have, I have interest in multiple different places and at any given time, whether that's four or five things I'm thinking about for work, for personal life, um, physical fitness, health, family. And so it's, it's, you know, how do I, what keeps me up at night is probably thinking about everything and not trying to think about one thing or giving up and not thinking about anything. If you could have the cover of Forbes or whatever publication you'd really love to have, what would be the message on it? That would be the, if I was on the cover myself, the person who saw the future of music and steered the industry that way. Oh, boom. Okay. See if that happens. I love it. And um, searching for Mana, um, the, the show is, is looking for, you know, the magic out there in innovation and industry and with leaders. And so we like to find out what your Mana is. So, um, Mike, what would you say your Mana is? And Mana is, you know, in gaming, your your magic power. So you've got your life and your power and you've got your magic, which might be um, a special skill that you've got. In terms of characteristic, what would you say your mana is? Um, there's always a solution to most problems. Uh, and my, what I think of my superpower is being able to and take in a lot of different uh, data points, a lot of different information, and then also helping to translate that into how that works with people. So which is always the hardest part to move innovation for is how do you convince the people around you, the people you work with, the people in your industry, the people that kind of create influence and in decision-making around you, how do you steer them all in a single direction? Because you can have a great idea, but if you can't steer the people around you, then that idea tends to fall flat. Love it. How would you put that into like one or two or three words? Uh, start with a simple analogy start with a simple task or goal and then work your way backwards from there um, and people generally are able to keep simplicity in their heads and work towards something now getting to that simplicity is is always the biggest challenge because uh, it's easier to get over complex than to streamline down to something simple love it um, would there be anybody you'd highly recommend in our journey um, of searching for mana that we would look to get on the show next. Oh, I should probably send you a few folks afterwards. I don't want to, I don't want to name any names now and put them on the spot. <laughs> ah, come on. <laughs> uh, let me think. Actually, one person who's on my board, a gentleman, Troy Carter, who's been in the music business for years, worked at Spotify, was Lady Gaga's manager. Ooh. Interested in deep music discussion and how music works. Troy, is, Troy would be special for you all. <laughs> Troy, Troy gets Lady Gaga on, he can come on. Um, yeah. And then final one of this um, quick fire round um, in terms of like, it could be a, a quote or a mantra, or it can be a book. Is there something that you just go back to the whole time that you found a really valuable resource? Um, there are a few things that I go back to as, as valuable resources. Um, you know, I do use decision-making frameworks. You know, I'm sure people have mentioned this maybe on your podcast before, like the Eisenhower framework of urgent and important. So that I always go back to is just sort of level setting what I need to do in the, in the moment. Um, read a lot. I don't have a single quote that I stick out there, but, you know, sort of all of those things together sort of keep me focused and, and try to, you know, on a single path forward. How, like how much are you reading on a daily basis? <clears throat> two hours a day. Wow. Um, yeah, an hour, two hours. And it, by the way, reading includes things like sub stacks and emails. And work, uh, I try to, that's excluding all of the Slack email uh, communication I do at work. I'm at least reading an hour or two a day. Yeah, it's, it's one of the like habits that you must stay on top of because, you know, everybody, 
it's so busy or feels like you are and you can let it yeah. slip because you're reacting to like you say a slack message or you know uh, some type of capitulation in your day um, and that type of knowledge accrues over time and so there are certain habits that you know I find the people who are reading two three hours a day yeah. and manage to do that and they're becoming very knowledgeable mm -hmm. based on doing that you have to build in some type of habit to stay on top of it do you have any type of ritual or routine that maintains that type of behavior so i mean from what i do is um i mean very very tactical i use something called instapaper so if i'm reading an article online and i know it's more than 15 second 30 second read i try to save it for later and i'll maybe get back to it over the weekend so at least i have a yep. kind of a, my own sort of magazine that's formed you know throughout the week um, and then if i'm reading a book I do take the time to actually write my own short synopsis and keep notes of everything I read. Oh, that's that's top level stuff. That <laughs> no, no, some of that is very some of that is cutting and pasting from the internet, but at least I have a list in a you know sort of online yeah. folder of different books I've read. Um, so if I ever because otherwise if I read something, I I tend not to remember I've even read it over the years too. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean it is still still going into that computer. I I love to try and still read physical books as much as possible. Oh, absolutely. And what I really love is when you get, you know, because I'll, I'll, I'll typically try and buy like a secondhand copy. And uh, when, you, when you get one and someone's just like scribbled all over it and underlined it, it's like, oh, I love that. That's super cool. Yeah, I don't, I don't scribble and underline in the book, but I, I, do, I do read physical if I can, because otherwise I'm going to go check out Twitter or. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's, it's, it's a nice experience, isn't it? It's getting, so, hard, it's getting harder and harder to read. <laughs> Mike, if you could take us back as far as possible, um, you know, really set the scene in who Mike was when he was mm. growing up and think of the moment where you might have start thinking about, you know, who you were and defining yourself and perhaps what a future for you might be like, please. Yeah, so I'd say that if I went all the way back, I, I tried to play an instrument growing up. And I don't know, similar to your singing, I was not a good guitar player. <laughs> I just realized it was not something I could do, but I really enjoyed music and then um, as well as film and I'll maybe weave that in there. And then in high school, since I wasn't a good guitar player, I managed a band of high school classmates, but I wasn't in the band itself because I wasn't musically talented enough. So I was the manager. And then in college, the same thing. I did kind of party promotion and managed and sort of secured bands for different parties and everything. So I was always kind of on that side of the, the space. What, what, at, at that point, yeah. just before you go forward, that's really interesting. <clears throat> um, so, you, you, you know, you had a guitar, perhaps you weren't, you know, fantastic on it, like me with my singing, but you loved it. So I assume the experience was you must have been inspired by certain bands or experiences like who, who was that? Yeah, I mean, at that time, it was kind of late 80s, you know, metal, Metallica, Anthrax, Maiden <laughs> was kind of where I was coming from, maybe a little Guns N' Roses. And then, and then grunge started, and then definitely sort of Nirvana, Soundgarden, et cetera, was my sort of core sort of listening behavior around that time. And But at the same time, I realized I was never going to be, you know, Cobain or Kirk Hammett from Metallica. So, so talk us through that, that band, the first one that you managed. So it was a band when I was in high school. They were a heavy metal band, uh, a lot of Rage Against the Machine cover songs. And <laughs> I got them gigs at a few parties and a few school events. Um, some of that was a little aggressive music to be playing in front of people at the time, but uh, it was it was an interesting experience. You didn't manage to commercialize that and off into the uh, sunset with that particular no, cover band. No, the band broke up due to artistic differences. <laughs> you know, so too hard, et cetera. So, so that gives that gives you a taste though of okay, this could be my involvement in this, and I mean this already makes some type of sense, obviously. And then you yeah. go and do this again at. Um, at college so just if you carry on with that story i did a little bit more sort of um securing bands working inside of um sort of party promotion but sort of general college activities university activities um i was also studying i did a little bit of film study in college too but what really interested me was always for some, whatever reason was sort of behind the scenes on how the entertainment business evolved um and that was behind the scenes of music and the film industry as well where were you living uh, in college in Philadelphia. So that was sort of, I was always reading books and sort of thinking about that. You know, I was reading even at the time, like Billboard magazine, not necessarily see who was at the top of the charts, but I was always interested in 
the behind the scenes of how the music and entertainment business work. Um, and then after college, I went to work for a few years on Wall Street where I, I covered entertainment stocks. Um, so DreamWorks Animation, Pixar, uh, actually when, while they were public, I was trying to write, was writing research reports on Pixar, the movie theater business, um, and a few other things that emerging video game companies at the time and really understood exactly sort of financially how these businesses worked. Um, and that was really eye-opening for me as well. Why did that happen at that point? You know, like, let's say if you'd thought truly with just, and this might be wrong, but truly with just the passion, you go straight into the entertainment in, industry, but you went on to Wall Street and there's many reasons that will, yeah. I'm sure have been useful. That was you at a point in life where you were thinking, this is a prestigious career. I need to earn a certain amount. There was competitiveness to it. Why, why did that happen? Yeah, I, it was probably a few reasons. It was, you know, coming out of University of Pennsylvania, a lot of people from Morton go to finance. So it's kind of generally that's where a lot of people were headed. Two is, you know, I interviewed at a few other things uh, and breaking into creative industries from the business side is not always the easiest thing to do. You kind of have to sort of work your way in in a few different areas. And I just got totally lucky with my first job. <laughs> it was an online posting for a media entertainment analyst. And I was like, that's it. I might as well just go for it. And for whatever reason, I got the job and it took me a little while to get it, but it ultimately turned out to be a little bit of pure luck, but also like, I was like, this is what I'm going to go for. I'm going to go for this hard where probably some of the other things I was looking at during college to go into were, were not as uh, top of mind for me. And so therefore I probably didn't push as hard. Yeah. This is a, topic that's really mm -hmm. interesting you know yeah. luck um and luck uh, and, time. Yeah. and we had um uh, uh, an amazing professor who's brought a book out called connecting the dots and it's about serendipity yeah. um and i really you know I'm, there are obviously some 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 fortunate things that happen but if you're preparing yourself and if you're thinking about what it is that you want then the moment an opportunity is presented and let's use your example you interview a lot of people i interview a lot of people Part of what I'm looking for is just huge conviction that they really would be delighted to secure this, right? You're, you're looking yes. for that. Yeah. And so what I suspect happened there was like you say, you're just like, oh my God, this is amazing. I get to like take this, you know, great education. I get to do what looks like a, a really good job. And also I'm going to get my like thrill of being involved in this particular niche I'm super involved, yeah. excited about. So you probably just interviewed with so much passion for that perhaps did your research but it would have just come across so I don't know how much that is luck and um, there's there's always elements of like that debate but I think that's you you know being able to really go for it with conviction well luck was coming across the opportunity yeah totally unqualified like most people are entering Wall Street brick building spreadsheets reading a balance sheet was definitely not something I knew how to do at the time so it wasn't like I could offer that much you know experience like any entry to level job you have sort of post-university um, but it was definitely like, this is what I'm going to go after. And I'm, I'm probably, while I was interviewing now in hindsight, as you're saying, that, I was probably enthusiastic, eager, you know, I was willing to put in the extra hours, work nights, weekends, because it was like, okay, that's what I wanted to do. And that, that kind of serendipity in that moment really sort of got me going, I think a lot. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. And Mike, then we're just carrying on with your journey, obviously, ultimately to, yeah. to, you, to you, you joining SoundCloud five years ago. You know, is there a particular trail in it that you'd like to talk us through or a story? So we're, um, I think one of the things is always with careers is kind of where you start and how, if you want to sort of steer your career in a slightly different direction. So I was working for a few years on Wall Street and, you know, I got a few offers to go work at hedge funds and I was sort of interested, but, you know, it's for some reason it didn't feel like the right move. Um, and then serendipitously, I also got a, uh, an opportunity to go work at Universal Music. Um, now, this is kind of early, mid-2000s, where the music industry was just getting over, was, you know, Napster had rifled through the music industry. And basically, the business the industry went from $30 billion a year in revenue to 15 very quickly. It nearly lost half of its sales, and, and downloads had yet to come online. And so was, there's kind of transition to digital that happened to music way before it happened in film, video, et cetera, probably a decade before or so. Um, so I got an interesting opportunity to go work at Universal Music. And the idea there was to form a group to build uh, direct-to-consumer products from within Universal. 
which was a really sort of advanced thesis uh, that it was exciting and thrilling. And I was also realizing like, if you could get this to work in music, this is kind of the way the industry is going to work for the next 20 years thereafter. Lo and behold, I got in the job. It was really interesting. Great group of people. I'm still close with many of them today. They've gone on to bigger, better things across music and technology. Um, but realized that the timing wasn't right and the music industry wasn't fully embracing it. It was still in protectionary mode and trying to protect the legacy business while kind of essentially stifling growth into digital. So I spent a year there and then decided to move on, realizing I needed to, uh, to get out of the music business at that time. Whilst this is all going on, what's going on outside of work? What's forming in your, you know, at this point, adult, adult life whilst you're pushing yeah. this career? Um, outside of work, I was starting to, well, I was an athlete in high school, um, didn't carry through into, into college. So one of the things I was trying to figure out is how do I get out some of my energy? Uh, so I started running, I was running quite a bit at the time. I was running marathons sort of in that mode at this time. And then outside of that, it was kind of, you know, trying to find, trying to find and start eventually start a family being single in New York city. So there's part of that lifestyle too, for sure. So we completely skipped the athlete part in college. So what sport was uh, that? Before college. <laughs> before college, what sport was yeah. that? Uh, I played football and I wrestled, American football. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. Amazing. So and then two great sports to play when you're younger, two not great sports to play as you get older. <laughs> so, yeah, when, you know, when you've got a busy schedule and you're working, but you get to that point where you're like, I need to stay fit or I want to, you know, yeah. uh, get get the energy out, then you, you found marathon running. What did you, did you have a particular PB that you, uh, you were proud of at that point? PB meaning, oh, personal uh, best. Personal best, yeah. Uh, I did run a 3.30 marathon. Wow, oh, okay. Yeah. That's like could not do it again. I did, could not <laughs> do it again, and I'm surprised that I still, I'm surprised that I did it. And, and now you haven't kept running up, or you do? No, and I, I did a few marathons, and as I got into my 30s, started to have ankle troubles and realized it was better switching my my uh, health endeavors out of marathon running and as i started to build a family you know spending four hours on a saturday running around central park in new york was not best for that either with kids what well, um if anything brings us up from that point to um soundcloud mike yeah so to sort of take that from the music business i then spent a few years at viacom um, big entertainment at the time, and Viacom's been a little bit different now. It's now called Paramount. Viacom at the time owned a film studio, Paramount, Nickelodeon, uh, MTV Networks, Comedy Central, um, some international assets. It's probably one of the three or four bigger sort of cable TV businesses. And at the time, in late sort of 2007, 2000 to 2010, the cable business was doing unbelievably well. I mean, it was kind of if you have to study sort of businesses. Cable TV was one of the all-time great businesses because the consumer paid huge amounts per month, $100, $150 a month for access to multiple channels. And those channels got fees from the consumer, even if people weren't watching the channel. Yeah. So and then on those channels, you had to subscribe for particular channels. Unbelievable. Yeah, you had to subscribe additionally for specialty channels. But so, and then you had advertising dollars on top of it. Yeah. So margins were incredible. There was built-in growth. Um, all of those things. And, and uh, it was a great business, but I, I realized I was always sort of more interested in what's next after that versus trying to, you know, milk the existing ecosystem. Um, and again, great group of people that I worked with, some unbelievable folks on MTV, some folks in Nickelodeon, you know, my general counsel, I sort of met there. He's my, you know, GC now. Um, so great group of relationships, but realized I actually wanted, and I was at a corporate job at that time, sort of helping to lead strategy, M&A, uh, kind of company venture type investments, et cetera. I wanted actually an operating role, uh, which led me to go work at IAC, which is Barry Diller's holding company, um, which has an unbelievable track record of uh, folks joining the M&A team and the corporate teams and ultimately leading and operating some of the portfolio businesses. Yeah. So, so that's how... I spent a few years at IEC and then went to work at Vimeo where I really got the first hand look at, you know, what I'd say creative technology, creator economy, um, which was not a word when I started working at Vimeo. We knew our business was creator focused, but you try to talk to investors about that or you try to talk to you know, our parent company and people were just sort of baffled as to how you could 
build a business off the back of creators and creative professionals. It was always, media was always, you know, basically built the other way around, which is you focus on making money from the consumer and the studio and the IP kind of provides everything else on the side. And so we were sort of seeing that at Vimeo and we were trying to always make that work. Yeah, Mike, thanks. Yeah. I think that that's kind of brought us up to where we can go to the final part of the show. And I know Definitely. your time is very precious. So um, not, not too many further questions from me, but I do want to give you the chance to, as somebody who's always been looking at the future yeah. and what this space could look like, and please do that through SoundCloud Spantage if you want. Um, you know, not hard to predict that over the next year, but it might be it might be like refreshing to do it with a seven year horizon. Like with the opportunity we've got right now, how like we've, there was cable TV, you know, then there's been Spotify, and then you know we've got all this kind of like creative content being put back into the artist's hands. What might this look like in seven years? So the last ten years of music have been changing the relationship with the consumer. The next ten years will be the relationship with the artist and the creator. And I say that in, in many ways, like right now, music is all about access to a catalog. The future is artists and fans directly sort of finding each other online, and whether that's through communities, direct transactions, manifesting in NFTs, that's coming. Um, and the whole landscape will shift in that direction. Uh, and so I can't say exactly what it looks like, but I know that's coming because I know in music and in sort of other media formats, every 10 years or so brings something new. And Spotify has been around for 15 years now, 14 years. So it's kind of at that next leg of its journey is about to come. What I don't want is, you know, the simplification of things. Like if you look at brand logos, um, I mean, we've done this ourselves as well. Like you know, everybody's like a, a herd of sheep. Is like they've moved from all different types of font and like creatively looking to just like everybody's got the same font and logo, right? And it's yeah. this whole kind of like simplification of things. And I think in what is maybe the most creative thing that humans do and music and, yeah. you know, culture is so important to us. The, what we definitely want is more of it and we want more variation. And we well, certainly what I don't want is just like, here's the top 10 acts in the world and all the the values going to them. And like, they are just literally these phenomenal superstars and then there's nothing else, right? You, you want everything in between. So even if Lloyd and the Mononites don't have a big audience, you know, there, there might be some corner of the internet that's interested in the rubbish that we put out and that's good. So is that the way that you see it? Or do you see like many things have, have moved that it moves to this simplification of few but like Billie Eilish is, who are just massive superstars. Well, Billie Eilish was a superstar, was an overnight success years in the making. And I think that's the key for, you know, either acts are sustained like Lloyd and the Mennonites, who've got a fan base of 50 people who go see you at a pub at some point, but will always come see you no matter what you do, even if your music is terrible, which is incredible. Now, I want those acts to succeed. I want the acts who are taking a shot at becoming big superstars. And even the superstars, when you really hear their stories, rarely are they ever kind of true overnight success and the industry got them going and everything happened. I mean, Billie Eilish uploaded her first track to SoundCloud in like 2014. And it wasn't really until 2018 where she actually started to really gain popularity and traction. So there's there's those stories are, are few and far between of the sort of you know mega 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 stars only becoming mega stars. So it's but in music, Lloyd and the Mononites, if you could sell out Wembley, you would, right? So always the dream is there. You always have oh, to keep the dream alive to that superstardom. Um, final question for me: um, a huge movement to what you're yeah. on, which is a podcast. Yes. <clears throat> What's SoundCloud doing in the podcasting space? We podcast can be hosted on SoundCloud, but from a company-wide perspective, it's not our focus. We're focused primarily on music because you can only focus on so many things and music's got a lot of opportunity. Absolutely. Mike, um, just, you know, finally, if you want to say anything to the audience, just to wrap things up. No, I, I'd say, uh, you know, back to sort of as my career trajectory, even in the earlier days, if you see that opportunity, go for it because you'll probably, you know, you'll feel... 
if you're interviewing for a job and you want to, and it's something that you really want, go for it at that point. Cause if it feels right, you're probably gonna do a lot better getting it. So go for it. Love it, Mike. Thank you so much for your valuable time. Thank you very much for the time too. This was awesome.